Hey guys, it's Lane and Blake with Redefine Horizons, and this is the CAD meeting that I am recording for next week, which will be Monday, August 8th. And uh, I am behind a couple weeks on my CAD meeting videos, so I apologize to the folks on my team that do CAD work. So we're going to uh, teach you a couple things uh, in this uh, CAD meeting. We're going to teach you a little bit about how line type scale works and how environmental variables work. I'll send this video to my friend Hunter, who is perpetually confused by line type scales in CAD. <laughs> and, and we're going to teach you a little bit about the data extraction wizard in uh, in AutoCAD Bricks CAD, which is pretty cool. All right, so let's talk about line type scales. So in AutoCAD, uh, you can assign uh, uh, different kinds of patterns to your lines, um, and they're usually dashes. So this is a center line line type, and this is a, a, a dash line type. Uh, but there are other kinds of line types, not just dash patterns. Um, so for example, if we came in here, and I'm going to just drag this panel out. Uh, it's not letting me drag. All right, let's come up here. Sorry. OK, so uh, you can do line types that are, are not um, just dash patterns. So let's make a new layer. We're going to call it survey lines topo uh, fences. OK, and then uh, the way you set a line type is right over here uh, in the layer dialog. OK, um, right here you see line type. And so uh, we're going to load. Don't ask me why you have to load, but you do. OK, and we're going to go get a fence line type. And that actually has um, a shape in it. Oh, man. OK, here we go. So you could choose a fence with a square post or a circle post. We'll do a circle post. OK, and uh, let's make that a different color than white just so we can see it. OK, so um, you can see this line type has uh, shapes, not just dash patterns. So you can you can see the shapes there. All right, so that's how line types work. <clears throat> um, OK, now, the spacing of the dashes matters, right? And that's um, when you're in model space. So right now I'm in model space. The, um, the spacing of the dash pattern the line type pattern is controlled by uh, an, what, what they call an environment variable in AutoCAD. So it's a variable. Um, and it's called line type scale. That's the name of the variable. And so like most environment variables in CAD, if you type the name of the variable, it will let you set the value. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to type line type scale. Whoop. Oh, you know what? I've got it abbreviated as LTS. OK, and then it, it lets you set a number here. OK, so um, let's go ahead and set the line type scale to 1. So you can see it looks like they went away. But if you zoom in really close, you can see the dashes now because the line type scale is not salt. Um, the line type scale is not big enough for the scale of the drawing. Now, I just happen to know this is I'm in model space. This is true to life scale. Um, so this is a road and, it, and it, I think I have these set at like 25 feet wide. So at, at that particular scale, to have line types that appear appropriately, I need a line type scale of about 40. And it, if you're a land surveyor, you know what I'm talking about. This is the horizontal scale of your drawing. OK, now you can go the other way. You can make your line type scale really big. So let's do 200. And you can see that doesn't look quite right either. right? So you, you want to have an appropriate line type scale for the scale of your drawing. So in this particular case for this drawing, it's 40 different types of drawings will need a different type of line, line type scale. Now, that environment variable is what we call, uh, it, that controls line type scale on a global basis. In other words, across the drawing. Now, you can do, you can control line type scales um, by entity with what we call a property override. Okay, And I'm going to show you how to do this, but it is really evil. Property overrides are evil, and you don't want to use them. Okay, But I'm going to show you how to do it, just so you know. So I can grab this particular line here and in the properties you will see it has a line type scale override here okay so it's set to one that's the default now if I change this to 0.5 you'll notice that I get twice as many fence posts in my fence line 
okay, and they also get smaller. That's because I've overridden that variable. Okay, and what this property override does is this gets multiplied by the actual global scale. So it, it's a it's a multiplication factor. So now this actually has a line type scale pattern. The pattern has a line type scale of 20 now because you have to take 0.5 times my global line type scale of 40. Okay, so most of the time in my shop you do not want to do this. Okay, so we almost never override line type scales. We want line type scales to be one. Okay. I'm sorry, my wife's all fired up and she's hollering at her niece in the other room. <laughs> so you can't hear too much of that. All right, <clears throat> so um, if the world were simple, all you would ever have to worry about is uh, model space and then it wouldn't be too hard. You would just set your line type scale to, you would set your line type scale to the horizontal scale of your drawing and um, it would be it would be simple and it would be easy, but uh, that is not how the world works because we have paper space. Okay, so in paper space, um, you have a separate environment variable that controls your line type scale in paper space, and it is called paper space line type scale. Okay, and I'm gonna explain how that works in a minute, but here's the interesting thing. When you go from model space to paper space, you have to change your line type scale or your line types don't work right. So let's do that now. So in paper space, Almost always in my shop, you want your line type scale when you're in paper space to be one. Okay, so now that I've entered a line type scale of one, these line type scales are printing at the appropriate size. Okay, the patterns are at the appropriate size in paper space. Okay, with a line type scale of one. Okay, you'll notice when I set the line type scale to what it looks, what it needs to be to look properly in model space, the dashes don't work here, right? because um, the line type scale is way too big. Okay, so just to clarify, this is a little bit funky. To get your line type scales to look properly, to excuse me, to look proper, you have to set a different line type scale whether you're in paper space or model space. When you're in model space, you set your line type scale to the scale of the drawing, the horizontal scale of the drawing. When you're in paper space before you plot, you set your line type scale to one. Now you'll notice if you do this right and it looks right in paper space, when I go over to model space, it doesn't look right because now my line type scale is one, it's way too small, I got to set back to 40. Okay, so what I normally do is I draft in model space with the line type scale that makes it look correct in model, model space and when I go to plot, I reset my line type scale to one. Okay, now, let's talk about this other line type variable. It is called uh, paper space line type scale. Before I do that, let me set these. I want you guys to see this. So I can set, okay, so I've got two viewports here at a different scale, okay, different scales. And then I've got a couple lines here just drawn in paper space like they would be uh, in a legend, okay? So these are not in a viewport. These lines are in the viewport. Okay, so let's see what happens now when we mess with this other variable, so it's PS, paper space, LTS, paper space line type scale. Okay, and it, it's a little bit different. This environment variable is either on or off, zero or one, okay? So, right now it's set to one, okay? And that's the behavior I want, what, what that we typically want in my shop. What that means is, if your line type scale is set to one, that means it's going to make all of your lines look the dashes look the same size regardless of the scale of the viewport and that's what we want i don't want the dashes in this viewport the the, the the pattern of the line type scale to be the pattern of the line type to be different than the size of the pattern of the light type in this viewport i want them to look the same because they want to plot the same so let's just see so if i want these to be set to one let's see what happens when we set them to zero okay when we set them to zero and do a region you'll notice that these lines still look good in model space, but we no longer look good in the viewports. The line type scale uh, no longer looks proper. The pattern doesn't look proper. Now, notice what happens now when I set my line type scale to 40, what it what it needs to be set up to look property in, proper in model space. Okay, Now, it looks good in this viewport, but it's too small in this viewport. It's half the size because this viewport is half the scale and it's way too small here in paper space. Okay, so when paper space line type scale is set to zero, 
line type skills just don't work in paper space. They just don't work very good. Okay, so to fix that, you go set your paper space line type scale to one. You want it, you want AutoCAD to use that. Do a region. Okay, and then set your line type scale to one. And everything, all your line type dashes draw at the same size. These all match. Okay. Regardless of the scale of the viewport or if the lines are outside of the viewport and paper space. Okay. So that's kind of that's a little bit complicated, right? So to rehash. When you're drafted in model space, set your line type scale, LTS, to the scale of your drawing, whatever the horizontal scale of your drawing is. If you're a surveyor, you know what that means. Okay. When you're in paper space, set your line type scale to one and always leave your paper space line type scale variable turned on. Always leave it one. If you do that, line types will appear correct. Never, ever, ever, ever override the line type scale with a property override in the properties dialog. Okay. All right, one other thing I just want to show you guys about line type scales. So we'll go back in the model space, we'll set our line type scale to 40. Now, line type scales get a little funky with polylines or 3D lines. And so let me show you why. Okay, so there's a polyline. We're going to put it on the fence layer. So there's this other interesting property, okay, that uh, linear entities have, and it is called um, line type scale uh, generation. So it's right here. You can see it down here. And um, you can either disable it or, or enable it. So it's like an on off. Okay, now if it's disabled, you'll notice this short segment of my polyline doesn't get the pattern. There's no fence post here. Okay, now that's okay in this case, but if you have a polyline with really short segments, all the segments are really short, what happens is it, it makes it look like your line type scale pattern isn't being applied. It really is, it's just that all our segments are too short. For the pattern we've selected at the line type scale we have. Okay, so if you get in a situation like this, you can turn on the line type generation. This is again, this is per entity, so this is there's not a global setting here. Okay, and then it will count your pattern from the beginning of your polyline and it will add the pattern. Now it looks a little funky, this looks cleaner. Okay, but if you have a polyline with a lot of short segments. Um, you have to turn this on. Now my dog is barking. I'm so sorry. Okay, so that's how line type generation works. Okay, so usually for what we're doing, um, if you're doing a topo and we're drafting with polylines, you're going to want to have this enabled. You're going to want to enable line type generation. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do in our video is we're going to talk about uh, data extraction. We're going to walk through the data extraction wizard in BricsCAD. Uh, AutoCAD has something similar. It's something I, I learned about fairly recently, but it's a super cool, super cool tool, and I have a drawing set up, and so I, I want to teach you guys about it. Okay, guys, let's look at this other uh, part of our training here, which is the data extraction wizard. Um, it's a super cool tool. Um, I've known about it for a little while, but I haven't ever really used it, and uh, so I started messing around with it a little bit. So it's an example of what I call uh, uh, ETL, uh, which is which kind of comes from the GIS world. So ETL is extract, transform, load. So it's it's a way to you know extract, change, and then load uh, data. So it's a way to move data between programs. And one of the things that we deal with a lot, not a lot, but we deal with on a fairly regular basis here at Redefine Horizons is moving data in between software programs so from Excel to CAD from CAD to GIS from GIS back to Excel vice versa okay so um, the data extraction wizard in AutoCAD is is a way to facilitate some of that um, and I'm going to show you some super basic stuff um, in in the tool today and then we're going to look at how we can complement and also uh, mimic and improve some of this functionality in AutoLisp. I hope I, th I think that would be uh, that would be a cool thing to do. So I'll try and remember to do that. Uh, so we'll write a little AutoLisp code, some extract, transform, load uh, AutoLisp code, <laughs> and we'll we'll see if we can get it to work. Um, and then uh, another cool thing would be to uh, do a little bit of Python scripting with the with the data that we uh, that we extract from a CAD drawing with the data extraction wizard, because that would just we could geek out on that. That would be cool too. 
All right, so um, I've got a couple examples here. So I've got some multi-leaders, and then I've got um, some polylines here, uh, the two tops of bank and a flow line. And we just want to see if you can imagine now you've got a drawing with with a bunch of data. Maybe you have 50 of these labels or 100 of these labels, and you wanted to extract the information into these labels and put it in a table maybe and load it into GIS. So you can imagine a scenario where each of these um, uh, leaders uh, uh, identified a, a point for a found monument. I didn't create the points, but we can certainly do that. Okay. So uh, let's say we've got a, a, a boundary survey drawing and we've got all these leaders uh, that identify the type of monument. Kind of also layered them so that the leaders on the green layer are for found monuments and the leaders on the red are for search found. And um, it gives you a description of the monument. And if there was tells you if there was a cap or tag or stamping, and then it gives you the uh, the record reference. Okay. Let me change this just to make it a little more realistic. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to try and get this data into a tabular format that we could potentially manipulate and then import into a GIS. So I want to show you how to do that with the data extraction wizard. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We are going to um, go to the tools menu in BricsCAD. And right here is this little wizard called data extraction. It's a, it's a little tool that runs a wizard. So we're going to go ahead and pull that up. Okay, so in order to do this function, this data extraction function, you need to have what's called a data extraction definition. And we don't have one yet, so we're going to go ahead and create one. Okay, and you you're going to save it as a text file. Okay, so I'm going to just uh, put this in my junk drawer for now, and uh, I'm going to call this M ML multi leader DE multi leader data extraction, and we'll just save it. Okay, your company should come up with a naming convention. We don't have one yet at RH because <laughs> we don't. I haven't used this tool enough. Okay, so that's going to store the definition for the data extraction. Okay, and we're 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 about to perform. We're we're about to uh, create the definition, and then the the software will execute the definition. Okay, so the first thing you want to do is select your entities. So I'm going to go ahead and select just my multi leaders. Okay, and uh, we don't need to extract entities from blocks or xrefs. Okay, and so then I'm going to hit next. So now it knows what I'm looking for. And what it does is, in this next screen is very important, is it gives you a list of all the properties that you see in the basically in the properties dialog um, for the particular entities that you picked. And what I what I'm going to do is I am going to um, oh I'm sorry that's in the next screen. So this right here is telling me hey you check the box for multi leaders. That's the kind of entities we're going to work with. Okay, now this is the box that lets you choose uh, the different properties that you that you would like to extract. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and sort this alphabetical order property because that's a little easier for me. And in the multi-leader, uh, it has this property right here called contents. Okay, so I'm going to get the contents out, and I also want uh, the leader, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, the layer. I want the layer, okay. So we're just going to get the layer and the text content out of the multi leader, okay. So then we'll hit next, okay. Now you can put this in a table or you can put it in a in a file, okay. And so we're going to put it in a comma delimited file, okay. And I'm going to just name it the same MLDE multi leader data extraction, okay. And that's it. We're going to hit finish. Okay, so it ran it ran the uh, data extraction. So let's go see uh, what we ended up with. All right, so here's our CSV file. Let's go ahead and open that. And so you can see um, what it did here is it gave me the count, how many of the entity, the name of the entity type, the multi-leader, and then it gave me the contents. Okay, it gave me the contents of the of the multi-leader. Now, this isn't 
this isn't super um, this isn't super helpful on its own okay but let me give you an example of what you could do with this in Excel so let's go ahead and open this in Excel and then we can do some basic data manipulation in Excel now I wouldn't want to do this in Excel all the time um, I would want to write some code probably some Python code that, that could if you're repeating this process over and over you'd you'd want to automate this with some code but we're just going to show you what you could do once you get the data in a CSV then you can do some data wrangling in, in Excel so let's go ahead and open that okay so we're going to go ahead and open this okay now it because you're importing a text file um, Excel gives you this import text import wizard okay we're gonna go ahead and hit next and then we're gonna uncheck tab and check comma so now because this is a CSV it's gonna it's gonna split my data up into columns which is good that's what we want so we'll hit finish okay so now I've got uh, my data in Excel at least it's in columns okay but I don't care about the count or the name of the entity so we can just delete those okay so now I've got the two pieces pieces of data that I want but but even here I want to do some little more I want to do a little more more manipulation data wrangling so in a multi-leader when you have a line break a hard return when you hit the enter key AutoCAD puts in this slash P okay that's a special character that it uses for uh, a new paragraph and that's actually helpful for us because I want each part of the description in the multi-leader the content I want in its own column. So let me show you how we're going to do that. We're going to highlight this column, and then we're going to go to Data in Excel, and we're going to go the uh, we're going to use this text to columns, okay, wizard, okay, and uh, we're we're delimited. And this time we're going to check other, and we're going to put in that forward slash p. Uh, oh, you know what? We might have to do it. Uh, we might have to do it up here. We might have to say no. It's not letting me do two characters in here. Um, but if I thought I feel like it did that before. Hmm. All right, so this is still going to do what what we want. Um, actually, it's not because everywhere I've got a P, it's going to let's use the forward slash. All right, so this is going to do what we want, but we're going to get some extra P's, which kind of stinks. <laughs> I thought there was a way to run this with with more than one um, more than one uh, delimiter. It's only letting us use a single column delimiter, which kind of stinks. Okay, but this will get us part way through. Oh, all right. It doesn't like this, so let's move this over here because it needs some room. All right, let's try it again. So we're going to go text to columns. Oh, you know what we can do to fix this? Let's do a quick edit replace and that'll clean this up. Okay, so. Uh, I gotta remember where that's at in here. Uh, find and select. We want to replace. Okay, so we want to tell Excel ex replace forward slash p with just forward slash. Okay, now we can split this up properly with text to columns. So we'll go back to data. Text to columns. Delimited. Now we're selecting the forward slash. And we're gonna hit finish. Oh, except we want we want a different destination. So we're gonna put it here. Oh, it doesn't like that. What happens if we do this? Okay. Alright, so what it just did is it took this content that was in the multi-leader description and it split it up by the line breaks 
Okay, so now let me show you what we can do with that. So we can get rid of this column. Now we don't need it. Okay, and we can actually get rid of this row because we don't need that. Um, actually, let me put that row back. So now we, that we've broken this data up, we can do some useful stuff. So for example, we can come in here and we can say this is uh, monument type. I thought I had this, uh, I should have took this found out, sorry. Okay, so monument type. Okay, and this we can call this uh, stamping. Okay, or marking. Let's call it marking. Okay, you could call it identification maybe. Okay, and then this we're going to say uh, map reference. And then um, now over here on the layer, okay, what I really want to know um, is, is the monument founder set based on the layer, okay? And so we can do that again with a simple edit replace. So we'll say find, and we're going to say uh, survey boundary points mons found. We want to replace, which is found. Okay, so replace all, and then we're going to say uh, survey boundary points mons SFN. So the, again, these are the names of the layer that we had the multi-leaders on. I'm going to put SFN. Okay. All right, and now um, we're going to change this from layer to um, we're going to say found or not. Okay, so now we've got our data out of CAD, and this is actually. Um, data that tabular data now that we can manipulate in AutoCAD uh, I'm sorry manipulate in Excel or this is data now that we could potentially import into a program like uh, uh, QGIS we could import this into a GIS program so now it's probably not worth it might not be worth all that effort for just four of these entities one time it might be easier just to open Excel and type the data in but when you get a lot of this data and you're or you're repeating this process over and over you can set up this data extraction wizard, and and you can either, um, you know, you could you could write some Python code to manipulate that CSV to get this result from that raw data extract from CAD, or um, you know, if you're comfortable uh, in Excel, you could go in and code this in VBA in Excel, or maybe do a macro recording in Excel, and you could record macros that would do these steps. Um, and you know, maybe I'll maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll do a video that shows you guys how to do a macro in Excel, but. Um, in, in, in another uh, video, but anyways, you guys kind of you can see kind of the basic process of how this data extraction works. All right, now let's look at another example. Uh, so this time we're actually going to get some kind of some more uh, geospatial data out of uh, the data extraction wizard. So I've got these three polylines here, and what I'm going to show you is how you can actually output the northing and easting and elevation of each vertex. So even if you didn't have something like Carlson Survey, even if you had Carlson Survey, you know you don't have to go in and drop a point on each node of a polyline to get these to get the the coordinates of the vertices, the nodes or vertices of the polyline out of CAD. So I'm going to show you how to do that with the data extraction tool. This time we're actually going to draw a table in CAD instead of doing an external file export. Okay, so we're going to go to that same spot, Tools, Data Extraction. Uh, we're going to create a new definition now because we're doing something a little bit different. And so I'm going to call this uh, PLV, Polyline Vertices Data Extraction, DE. Okay, so that's the, the definition. Okay, I'm going to select my entities. Okay, I don't need to extract from blocks or XREFs. It's telling me, hey, you can get information about polylines and polyline vertices. Now we want to check both of these. Don't uncheck polyline, and I'm going to show you why. I'll teach you teach you about handles here in a minute. Okay, so what we want now is we want to get uh, first of all we want to get the handle of the of the polyline. Okay, and a handle is a unique ID in AutoCAD. It's like a serial number for each entity, and we want that because we're exporting the vertices from more than one polyline. And in our table, we want to be able to match up which vertices goes with which polyline. So we need the handle. Okay, and the other thing we want to do is uh, we want to come in here and get the X, Y, Z of the vertices, and that's actually this position information here. 
Okay, position X, position Y, position Z. Okay, we'll go to next. Okay, and um, we're going to go ahead and create a table here. And we'll hit finish. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and create my table. Now, I'm going to just, I'm not even going to let you look at that because I don't have good units in this drawing. And so I don't want to show you fraction of inches. So let me fix that real quick. It's set to architectural. That's not what I want. I want to... Uh, I want decimal feet. So uh, now the nice thing is, uh, once you have that definition set up and saved, you don't have to recreate it. So now I can say, get, we're going to do data extraction based on an existing definition, and I can just select it. Okay. And come in here, everything's set up. Hit next. Okay, we're going to go ahead and draw our table. Okay, so now you can see in here, um, it output the three polylines at the top, and all it gave us was the handle. Okay, so this is the serial number. It's an alphanumeric value. Okay, and then it went ahead and gave us um, each vertices. Okay, and it gave us the handle so we can match up the vertices to the polyline. Okay, and then it gives us the X, Y, Z, and for some reason, for some reason my drawing units didn't change. Let's try that again. Units. going on here all right let me try this again I don't know why I didn't update the units in my drawing Okay, now you could export, yeah, it's still not working. You could export this data to a CSV as well, okay? So uh, this would be a way to extract the data for all the polylines in a drawing. And then you could actually get that data into Excel, run a little macro, and for example, convert that data, data to well-known text, and then import that into a GIS program, okay? So the data extraction wizard is super cool. I'm sorry this says funky architectural units. Most of my viewers are not, are not architects. Okay, now just, just to, to also illustrate, you could add the layer as a field here in your data extraction definition, and so you could actually extract layered polylines from your CAD drawing and put those into GIS, which is, which is cool. So anyways, we'll mess around some more uh, with the data extraction wizard and with um, you know maybe running some macros in Excel or doing some Python, a little bit of Python coding with the data that we get out of AutoCAD. Um, so you guys can learn a little bit more about how to move data between CAD and Excel, and Excel and GIS, and GIS and CAD. Uh, it's a very valuable skill for the modern land surveyor. So uh, anyways, uh, thank you for watching. I hope uh, some of my techs, Austin, Michaela, Elena, Cameron, um, can see how they might be able to apply this to their work on occasion. And uh, we'll, we'll learn some more about the data extraction tools in, uh, in BricsCAD. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Appreciate it. Uh, we will try and do another cat video here uh, in a week without um, a gap. <laughs> All right, bye.